So good evening once again to all the participants present here. So now the time is almost six o'clock and we are about to begin the fourth talk in our national webinar series on prospects and career opportunities in metallurgical and materials engineering, the way forward conducted by Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering, Amaljodi College of Engineering, Kanjirapalli, Kerala. So, in midst of this pandemic COVID-19, we hope everybody is safe in their home. And we appreciate the participation and the interest shown by the participants in attending this talk amidst this pandemic. And we request your continuous participation for our upcoming talks too. So now the particip many other participants are joining. So just wait for two, three minutes maximum and then we will start with the talk for this day. So we are seeing that some of the participants are still uh, confused about last week's participation certificate. So we will be rectifying all those doubts at towards the end and please uh, clarify all the doubts towards the end of the session and it is not regarding the participation certificate and all you can ask our distinguished speaker all the general doubts which you are having and it's not uh, related to this participation and all so you can uh, mail us if you have any queries regarding that things and 70 participants huh? Yes, sir. Mm, but many are joining. Yeah, I will be. So I think we can just start and uh, the participants will be joining with us soon. John sir, shall we start now? Yeah, yeah shall we start. No. Okay. So once again, a very fine good evening to one and all present here. So today we are heading towards the fourth talk in our uh, national webinar series on prospects and career opportunities in metallurgical and materials engineering the way forward. And today's talk is delivered by a special person. Dr. Rajesh sir from VAT University. He is an associate professor there. And uh, Dr. Rajesh sir will be uh, dealing with the talk on metallurgical and materials engineering. What you learn and where you land. And I am sure that this is going to be one of the very interesting topics for all the participants present here who are studying or who are currently pursuing their degree their bachelor degree in metallurgical and materials engineering and those who are working as well as research scholars and it will be highly beneficial for school students who are aspiring for a career in metallurgical and materials engineering field and i now invite dr john felix kumar head of the department metallurgical and materials engineering to officially introduce our distinguished speaker to the participants over to you john sir good evening as head of the department, Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering, Amal Jodi College of Engineering, Kanjirapalli, Kerala. I welcome you again all for the fourth webinar of National Webinar Series on Prospects and Career Opportunities in Metallurgical and Materials Engineering the way forward through this Zoom platform. The National Webinar Series consists of eight talks from eminent scientists and professors from reputed institutions, organizations on a weekly basis. In the webinar series today, on this fourth webinar, we have Dr. Rajesh as a resource person. Dr. Rajesh 
is currently associate professor of department of manufacturing engineering at vat bellu he worked as assistant professor in our department of metallurgical materials engineering maljodi college of engineering previously he was also as serving as lecturer at department of uh, nit suratkal he is a member of professional bodies like indian stock metals society for failure analysis and indian welding society he obtained his bachelor's degree in metallurgical engineering and master's in materials engineering and he has been metal forming all from the department of metallurgical and materials engineering nit suratkal his main fields of interest are severe plastic deformation composite materials biomaterials and material innovations for metal 3d printing he is the author of many scientific publication in the above areas i invite dr rajesh to deliver the talk on metallurgical and materials engineering what you learn and where you learn i welcome you sir thank you uh, uh, thank you dr john uh, head of department of uh, department of metallurgical and geo engineering uh, uh, manu harilal other faculties of uh, uh, department of metallurgical and geo engineering now uh, agc kanyarpalli i would also like to thank uh, the manager agc uh, principal agc for giving an opportunity for for, uh, for this seminar especially um, for for the students who would like to have a uh, career in the part uh, uh, in, in metallurgical materials engineering and uh, and this this particular talk uh, is going going uh, to give an highlight about what you going to learn in metallurgical engineering uh, something which uh, which is not completely covered in your in your text so so i uh, i i would heartily thank all all the organizers of this webinar Uh, for inviting me for this this, this talk i i i hope all of you um are, are safe and sound during this pandemic and we expect uh, this curve to flatten in the coming coming months so that we can actually do a lot of uh, a lot of learning productive things we coming up so without wasting time i would like to start my Rajesh sir, you can try now. Okay. One. Is there any issue with share screen? One second, one. Ah. Okay. okay, sir. Now it's working fine, sir. My, uh, my my talk uh, will be on metallurgical and materials engineering what you learn and uh, where you land after learning that um there is a conventional definition that you all know about metal metallurgy uh, that is given in your ncert textbook on uh, 11th and 12 uh, you find it in a chemistry textbook the, the the definition clearly says you know it it, it is an extraction purification and refining of metals but basically uh, ba basically uh, you how do you get a metal from an, from its ore 
Um, the school books have redefined the definition in, 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 the, uh, in the recent years. And this year, in 2020, if you just look at the definition of metallurgy in the NCRT textbook, it is like this. The entire scientific and technological process very clearly mentioned scientific and technological process used for isolation of metals from its core is called as metallurgy. Still, uh, this has got an inclination towards extraction of metals from the road again. Uh, uh, but something that they added out here is, 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 is there's a lot of science in this and a lot of technology in this. And that, that makes metallurgical metallurgy to be very much fit for, um, for an engineering branch. Uh, I don't say this definition is completely wrong or, uh, or completely correct uh, uh, because uh, because there's a because there's a branch in metallurgy which definitely deals with extraction and we call uh, that as extractive metallurgy. Got it. Extractive metallurgy is the process by which uh, you uh, you get a metal from its ore. Got it. From uh, you extract a metal from its ore. Got it. And how do you define an ore? Ore is a rock or mineral where you, you, you find a huge amount of metallic content from which you can extract this metal profitably. Profitably is something that has been given in the textbook uh, to be underlined. If, what does that mean? Does it mean that, does it mean that if the content of the mineral or metal is not sufficient enough uh, so that you can make profit, we don't call it as an ore. Got it. The mud, the mud that you see uh, in the cost of Kerala is reddish in color, which contains huge amount of huge amount of uh, iron. But if you just extract iron from that, you will not get the the profit because the, the cost of the process will be more because the content of iron in that will be literally less. So in, uh, in ores, the content of iron will be uh, iron or any many any metal will be really high, so they can extract metal. Once upon a time, we had 60 to 70 percentage of metallic values in iron ores in India, uh, which is very easy to be converted into, into iron and steel. Got it. Mother Earth is not that lenient nowadays. Mother Earth, uh, nowadays you don't get so much of iron, um, so much of uh, metallic values in the ore. I mean, what I mean, what I mean to say is the quality of ore is getting degraded uh, one you know, year after the year. So what we generally need to do is, uh, uh, under expansion metallurgy, you will be actually dealing with a course called mineral dressing. Got it. Mineral dressing is a course where you will be will be undergoing uh, 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 four processes: uh, size reduction and concentration. Got it. If the content of content of metallic values in your ore is only thirty percent We'll do dressing to that ore and make it to 60 and 70 percentage, and then uh, uh, then do it profitably. So mineral dressing is generally done before uh, extractive metallurgy. Mineral dressing is enriching the uh, the concentration of an ore. Mineral dressing is also reducing the size of an ore that so it can be fixed in. in the. So this is one course that you actually study in, uh, in metallurgy where you will be dressing. How you'll be dressing the ore? There are specific industries which work on. You, I'm sure that you know some of the knowledge like magnetic separation, force rotation, which are, uh, uh, sedimentation. All this, te this technology will be used uh, to actually dress them in. Um, uh, in extracting metallurgy, one of the most important courses to deal with is production of iron and ferro alloy. Got it. I'm very sure that you have you heard of the. Uh, uh, called blast, uh, this one called blast burn. Extremely tall, something like some, uh, something like a uh, nine-story building where the feed comes from the top. top. Got it. And the product that you get out of a out of a blast burner is called a pig iron. They call it pig iron because when you when you accumulate those iron in a in a, in a, in a, in a storage, they, they look like small pigs. Uh, uh, you know that's why they call it pig iron. Got it. The iron ore is feeded. Iron ore are generally oxide ore, so we call it the feed ore tree. The iron ore is feeded in a blast furnace. Right. Now, ores are generally oxide. We do not want, we somehow want to take out that oxygen. Right. So we add some reducing agents. The most common reducing agents uh, what we study in school is carbon. So we actually add carbon. 
uh, uh, carbon in the purest form, we call it metallurgical grade coke. We, uh, if you just look at uh, look at uh, the metallurgical grade coke in India, we do not have that. We have to actually import coke from countries like China, but we are rich in iron ore. But, uh, and and Chinese coke is not that inexpensive just like other products. They are very very expensive. If you just go for a barter system, ten ton, ten trucks of iron for one truck of coke is how 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 it works. When you add uh, carbon to this, you will have a reduction react reaction taking place. Uh, uh, from Fe to O3, oxygen goes with carbon, forming carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, and, uh, and what, 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 you get is, uh, what you get is iron. That comes out of the blast furnace from the bottom. Uh, it's called a pig iron. Pig iron will have a lot of carbon in them because you have used carbon to reduce. So pig iron generally will have a lot of carbon. Second course that you will be dealing uh, in extraction metallurgy is production of steels. Right. Steels generally should have a carbon content which is less than two percentage. So our job is to to take out carbon. Now, in pig iron, I told there are a lot of carbon around three to four percent of carbon which you need to take out. Got it. Taking out carbon, you get steels. Taking out in, in uh, um, in the uh, situation that you want, yeah. The voice is breaking, sir. Hello, is it okay now? Hello, yes, sir. Yeah. Hello, is it okay now? Is it okay now? And uh, now it's fine, sir. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, in, in, in steel making processes, we have, if you, if you want to remove the carbon, we'll have to add oxygen to the, to the, uh, to this iron. Got it. When you go on blowing oxygen, I'm not talking about air. Air is different. Air does not contain, air does, uh, air does not contain completely oxygen. Got it. I'm talking about pure oxygen. You need pure oxygen to be blown inside the, so when this oxygen combined with carbon, uh, again, you come out as carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and you maintain a concentration less than two percentage. Uh, actually, there is a lot of engineering in this. Somebody is asking you a 0.2 percentage carbon. You should be able to know how much oxygen to be blown, in what velocity it has to be blown, and uh, when when to start and when to stop. So there is there is a lot of engineering in production of steel taking place. Okay. So this is how you you this. this, this you will be studying this course in detail of how do you produce steel of various varieties. Got it. We have steel with high carbon content, low carbon content, etc. We also deal with uh, uh, non ferric extraction metallurgy. Got it. Uh, uh, when, you, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, periodic table, we have we Classify metals with ferrous and non ferrous. Uh, they say it is not that, uh, this is not, not fair because oh, one atom standing against all other atoms. Ferrous standing against all other, that's the importance of ferrous metal. metal. We, we, we have a lot of application with ferrous metal, ferrous metal or ferrous material, iron based material like steel, mild steel, high carbon steel, low carbon steel. There are plenty. Got it. And, and uh, if you want to make an alloy, sometimes a non-ferrous metal is added to, to a ferrous metal. For example, stainless steel has chromium, stainless steel has nickel. So, so we have to actually work on the extractive metallurgy of non-ferrous metals also. In non-ferrous metals, uh, there, are, there, are, uh, there are many metals which are very important. You know, you have seen your day-to-day -day life, copper wires that you use in your house. Copper wires that you use in a house for electrical conductivity, uh, your wiring purposes. Aluminium is the light metal that has been used in uh, uh, aircrafts. Got it. Aluminium is lightweight compared to steel. Steel is heavy. Aluminium is lightweight. It's been used in 20-25 percent of aircraft. Yes, yeah, sir. Just, just uh, sorry to interfere. Uh, now okay. also that voice uh, is uh, getting broken. Okay. Is it okay now? Uh, some some fan or some mobile something is there near you. One second. Is it okay now? Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So aluminium is a light metal. There are a lot of other uh, other non-ferrous metals like uh, zinc, nickel, copper, where we need to we, we need to study their extraction. So this this particular course, non-ferrous extractive metallurgy deals with uh, uh, deals with extraction of all these non-ferrous metals. Got it? You will be you will be taking up one or two courses on non-ferrous extractive and study all the uh, all the metals extraction in very brief. So that you know uh, that that that's enough for an undergraduate degree. So this you need to study um, something called th uh, thermodynamics, metallurgical thermodynamics. You know, uh, we we uh, we were discussing that carbon is the, is one of the best reducing agents, the most inexpensive reducing agents also. So uh, there is a question that you know if Al two O three Uh, can you remove oxygen from air to be using a carbon uh, sometimes not possible because the affinity of oxygen towards towards affinity of oxygen towards uh, aluminum is so high that the, car, uh, the energy uh, that uh, has been given by a carbon atom is not sufficient enough so 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 thermodynamically you would analyze uh, which is the reaction that takes place with the higher uh, free energy which is the one which takes lower free energy So these type of thermodynamic studies are required uh, to select the uh, uh, extractive metallurgy reactions. Got it. Uh, not only, uh, not not only, uh, uh, not only the the reducing agent. We have to study the temperature at which they act as a good reducing agent too. So 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 metallurgical thermodynamics deals with all this uh, um, kinetics as well as thermodynamic as as well with respect to um, um, enthalpy and entropy. Which uh, which we'll be dealing in in one course. Uh, this is something called as corrosion engineering. It is completely reverse. I uh, I so uh, we were discussing that um, we we uh, take a lot of effort uh, to take Fe two O three to Fe, which is not natural. You know, I don't like to be in Fe two O three. They don't like to be in Fe. But what you do is you add some uh, carbon to that, reduce it deliberately, and make it an Fe, and uh, uh, use it in your component. Iron will always try to go back to their natural state. They will, they will, and this photograph shows that iron rusted and it has become a Fe two O three again. Got it. Now, as an engineer, it's your duty. to actually prevent it from rusting because if so imagine if this happens on a on a bridge where you are traveling and the metal cracks it can be fatal so as an engineer it is your duty to understand the metal uh, understand corrosion engineering before designing anything now you need to you need to understand the metal how much corrosion will take place in how much years for that you need to know that where is So, where is that you're going to use your component? Is there any environment which is very close to which can cause corrosion? The any metallic part very near to a beach will corrode much faster than uh, uh, than a hilltop. Got it. So, the environment uh, in the vicinity of this material uh, and the susceptibility of this material towards corrosion should be understood by an engineer. So, you you will be dealing with the corrosion and corrosion engineering. Your a metallurgical engineer's job is also to design a material which can be corrosion resistant, just like a stainless steel. Stainless steel will, uh, will not undergo corrosion in normal conditions. In normal conditions. If you are giving the uh, a suitable environment for that, it will corrode again. Yeah. If you look at this uh, this photograph, this is a, this is a, uh, one of the first steel plant that we had in India. Uh, uh, it's called a Tata Steel plant. Was set up near a remote village in Panchi, in Bihar. Uh, the Jharkhand was not there that, uh, during that time. Just Bihar during the 1907, and it was not called a Tata Steel also. It was called a Tata Iron and Steel Company. Got it? They 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 started the first steel plant in 1907. Got it? Uh, uh, Government of India. Uh, uh, Government of India was actually uh, very keen uh, in. in In uh, in developing uh, uh, steel industries for India, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the reason why uh, Jawaharlal Nehru took up this assignment of uh, of making steel uh, in steel plants in India. 
uh, President Darjendra Prasad uh, delivered his address to the inauguration of Black Funnels 1 at the Rokula Steel Plant. Rokula Steel Plant was one of the, one of the first steel plants uh, that, uh, that happened in, uh, in India, which is the Dunman Run. It was an aerial view of Rokula Steel Plant. Uh, um, we 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 uh, couldn't get people to work on this industry because the, uh, the people were not trained in metallurgy. We were not trained in metallurgy, so we had a German collaboration, and German metallurgists came and uh, came and worked on those glass pieces, and they installed this plant. Got it? And they were staying back for a long, uh, long months and years because. The, uh, there were no, the, the no much metallurgists in India who could work and work in this plant. So, uh, so what government did was they selected a few engineers and sent them to Germany uh, to, to do a crash course on this metallurgy, and then 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 came then they came back and then then started uh, working on on this because Jawaharlal Nehru was a visionary when it comes to industry, and he 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 actually uh, envisioned that unless and until we we grow in steel sectors, we cannot compete with world economy. Got it. So then onwards, we started a lot of industries, a lot of steel industries, and uh, a lot of government steel plants. And now they are all combined and called as Steel Authority of India Limited. Uh, the, need of, the need of metallurgical engineering was, uh, was identified uh, by, first by Banaras Hindu University, now it is called as IITBHU, is the oldest in the country which has started a metallurgical engineering degree. The formal study of metallurgical engineering dates back to 1923 when Banaras Hindu University started their graduation program. It is called as Bachelor of Engineering in Metallurgical Engineering. The setting of the first steel plant in India by uh, uh, J. N. Tata in 1907 had necessitated, uh, necessitated the study of metallurgical engineering in the country. Uh, uh, there were a lot of steel industries coming out, and uh, there were not much graduates for the situation that then. And then onwards, you, 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 you see there, there, there happened to be many steel plants coming up, Bukaro, Durgapur, all these steel plants coming up, and the need of metallurgists increased drastically. In 1960s, you, 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 you see many institutes started uh, metallurgical engineering, like Indian Institute of Science. The IITs that we have uh, now, uh, uh, the regional engineering colleges, now it is called as National Institute of Technologies. Government universities like Jadavpur University and private universities like PhD Gondratur, they understood the need of uh, starting a BTEC in metallurgical, metallurgical engineering, uh, primarily to serve this Steel industries were there were plenty of jobs and there were no 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 people to take it up. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that you know where 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 you get, where, where, where you land when you take this course. Sorry, uh, this is this is uh, this is a process metallurgy sector. Um, uh, what I'm going to say, a steel a steel sector, an iron sector, or something like that. This was a call forward that was done in June 14, 2019, for metallurgical engineers. Got it. Metallurgical engineers um, uh, from Gates 2019, uh, where, we can, where we can see the pay scale when you start with. They say that when you start, you're getting an average pay scale of 40,000 per month. And the middle level, you get uh, almost uh, a 1 lakh a month, and the senior level, you do is highly selling. The process metallurgists, no. Process metallurgists, they always wanted to communicate to the young people these three things, which I feel I should share with you. Uh, whenever I, I meet them, they always wanted to tell the students about these things, uh, the, these three things which I want to tell you. There is a need to change the common perception about steel industry. Steel industry is no longer a dust and smoke emitting industry as most of the people think. Students are under the impression that working atmosphere in steel plants is hot and dusty. They are not even aware that steel industry has modernized itself considerably in the last many decades. The interesting concept of mathematical modeling, automation, and information technology are used extensively in steel industry. So it's not only so steel industry is not that you are, you are wearing a blue dress and getting getting in front of a furnace. No, no, it's not like that. 
Uh, if you just look at the previous slide, you can see that you know uh, a metallurgical engineer working in, in in AC sector, controlling all those steel plants, uh, 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 the rolling mills and other things, simultaneously. Sorry. And this is, this uh, this particular sector is does not have a gender bias. So I wanted to let you know because this this got an equal opportunity for for men and women. Of 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 of, 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 of irrespective of caste, creed, and religion, uh, if you have an intention to work. Yeah. Uh, this is all about uh, this, this, this is all about extracting metallurgy, and this is what you have learned. Uh, and and, and that, that's not bad, and that that really happens. There's a lot of in the, in the, uh, there's a lot of jobs in the in the sector, but. Uh, uh, metallurgical engineering is not only about extraction. You have to you have to study something else in metallurgical engineering also, and and we we just look into what is that. The the one that you need uh, need to look here is physical metallurgy. Correct. Physical metallurgy links the structure of materials with the properties. Got it. They say that there are some metals metals generally uh, uh, crystallizers is what they say. Some metal crystallizes in a BCC form. Some crystal, uh, metal crystallizes in FCC form. Some in HCP. So, uh, uh, so their properties depend upon their crystal. So, to establish a structure-property relationship is what you do in physical metallurgy. Right. Second aspect is if you want to do and go for an alloy. Sometimes it may so happen that uh, pure metal does not work your purpose. You will have to uh, have an alloy. Got it. Now, if you want, can you mix any two metals and form an alloy? Is the question. Maybe, maybe not. Got it. So, what are the criteria that uh, that you need to look into to form an alloy? But how does the alloy, alloy help you? Uh, uh, they will help you in uh, in, in having a higher mechanical properties. Does alloy help you in any any uh, other properties? Or what, what do you need to know that? And physical metallurgy deals with microstructural engineering. How does this material look under a microscope? Is something that we we we, we see in this right. So so this course actually deals with the structure of the material and the properties. Uh, this course deals with uh, um, with uh, uh, how an alloy is formed, uh, what what are things that you need to do in alloy and the microstructure. They say that something like so something like what you see uh, in in anthropism. Got it. Yeah. Uh, they say yeah, a material, the same chemical formula undergoes different uh, different crystal structure is what we call the lattice. Got it. So if you, if you just look at this, uh, you you can see that water, uh, if it's if it's just under uh, under under certain temperatures, if it's under certain temperatures like zero. You can see that uh, they become ice. Got it. Water is liquid above about this temperature. Got it. And after uh, uh, certain temperatures, you can see that in the form of gases. So the pressure temperature diagram. You can uh, if you are keeping the atmospheric pressure and you look at the look at, look at the um, uh, if you look at the um, the changes, you can see that you know there are materials which change their crystal structure at higher temperatures. So what happens to the material at higher temperatures? Uh, phase diagrams generally shows you uh, about the, the the microstructural changes or crystallographic changes that happens in the material as you go on heating the material, you're going cooling the material. What are the phase transformation it takes? Physical metallurgy deals with characterization. How do you know that the uh, how do you know that the uh, the material is how do you confirm that the material is having certain crystal structures? Uh, you know that is what the material characterization uh, does. Material characterization deals with uh, with, uh, with missions like XRD missions, where it revolves on the principle of diffraction, just like how you have seen in your uh, in your in your school physics. You know, There's something called the Bragg triangle of diffraction, called two theta value. In lambda, uh, uh, it's the two D uh, uh, science thing that is what you have studied in this. Uh, so, so uh, there are certain crystals. They say that diffraction takes place only at certain angles, is what they say. So, and that particular that particular density of plane is very very unique for a crystal. So, you can actually characterize this character, uh, uh, characterize this crystal with respect to. Uh, uh, so, this mission actually helps. So, if you are doing a metallurgical engineering, you will have to 
uh, work on this machine to find out the, the uh, find out the the various cryptographic planes that your crystal is having. And electron microscopy, uh, you will have to study optical microscopy just like how you study in schools also. But the resolution is a bit higher when you come for engineering. There are two types of uh, uh, electron microscopes that you generally deal with. One is the transmission electron microscope, where we'll be transmitting the electron. Got it. See, an optical microscope's resolutions generally do not go more than 1000 x Got it. Uh, now, uh, if you if you actually uh, uh, if you actually uh, go for a uh, uh, go for a magnification more than 50,000 or one lakh, you need to go for a transmission and come on. Light will not help you. You need to have an electron. Scanning electron microscopes. Uh, and so if you want the electron to transmit through a material, you need to have your system and it's extremely fine. And there is another microscope called this uh, scanning electron microscope. The image that you see out here is an image of an ant. Image of an ant. Look at look 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 at the small fibers that the ant is having on on a body. It's extremely clearly seen, which is which cannot be seen under an ordinary microscope because you will not get the depth of focus. It's all, all the same. But the scanning electron microscope again goes for a very high resolution. So we generally use this. So our microscopes to characterize this material, to understand how what, what is happening to the material. So if you are able to understand the, what is the structure of the material, you can predict the properties in the future. Another sector, another sector of metallurgical engineering is called as mechanical metallurgy. Mechanical metallurgy deals with, uh, uh, with, with the strength of material. When you make a material, uh, I'll have to test the material Strength. I'll have to test the material strength. I, ha I have to test if the material is really strong for my application or not. Uh, so uh, mechanical metallurgy uh, deals with uh, uh, finding out the strength of, uh, strength of material. If there is something that you can do to increase the strength, uh, all those aspects are deal that dealt in mechanical metallurgy. Got it. See, uh, the picture that shows here is basically um, uh, Titanic in Antarctic. Uh, uh, you can see that though, uh, the ship has fractured in a very brittle mode, whereas you don't expect metals to break like that. So, so we have to study if uh, phase transformations taking place in the material, transitions taking place in the material, is it affecting the mechanical properties or not? If you do not look into this, so a failure analysis of Titanic is basically a material failure. Uh, because ductile to brittle transition at lower temperatures was generally not studied uh, during those days, which has led a lot of progress in metal mechanical metallurgy after that. In mechanical me metallurgy, you will study about the other properties like fatigue, fracture, uh, creep, etc. Fatigue is basically uh, uh, a repeated loading. This is an engineering component which has undergone repeated loading. The stress may not be very high. But the, you undergo a repeated loading for so many years, the material ultimately fails. So you need to understand uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, scenario this material undergoes, what kind of environment the material undergoes, whether it is prone to fail, and if there is any way you can go for a fatigue resistant material, uh, or or you can predict the life of the component. All these things are studied in this particular course. We study the we study how the fracture happened. Fract the fracture study is nothing but a postmortem of the material. This happens after the fracture. Um, creep, creep is a phenomena by which uh, material fails uh, at a higher temperature. This, this, this photograph is basically a steam turbine blade. Uh, steam turbine blade will always be at a very high temperature because it's, it's, uh, you will have a super steam out here. Temperature is really high. It is constantly at a high temperature under a load and uh, this can cause failure of the material. Metallurgy, uh, metallurgical uh, engineering you also deal with uh, metal washing processes. Got it. Ultimately, uh, when you produce a steel, how do you take it out of the industry? Got it. The, you take it out of the industries in different forms. Useful shapes is what we call it. The, the shapes that you see out here is a rod, a plate, an eye section, 
and uh, sheet metal which has been which has been uh, actually uh, bent and uh, uh, and sheared according to the need of an automobile industry so all these processes will be studied in detail how to how to how do you make these shapes if you if you want to study this process you need to know about the materials very very close so another manufacturing process or metal working process the foundry technology where we call this as casting where we will be melting the metal pouring the all the idols that you see in the temples but all the idols that you see in the temples or uh, the old vessels that you use in the kitchens are all casted ones got it uh, so uh, casting in uh, foundry technology includes melting pouring into a mold of the required shape and solidifying and cutting out uh, the run of the rices and all all the elements that you are given in that so if you want to do this if you want to work on this you need to be a good design engineer to design a pattern uh, uh, uh you need to know about melting at what temperature it has to melt you need to know about pouring uh, so that the sound cost of the all those things will be detailed uh, uh, in this course for the sound design metal working we deal with three joining processes uh, one soldering brazing and welding soldering is not a um, uh, soldering is just uh, a mechanical joint uh, Uh, where uh, we uh, allow uh, the continuity in an electric circuit, nothing more than that. Got it. Brazing uh, deals with joining of metals. Brazing deals with joining of metals using a copper alloy. Using a copper alloy, where you have a capillary effect, is the cause of joining. Uh, whereas welding uh, is the most uh, superior joining processes among all the three when it comes to the mechanical strength. Um, So by joining with the same concentration of materials that you uh, use in the bare metal, got it? Um, uh, by a diffusion process, uh, joining is generally done by fusion welding. Um, there are uh, uh, there are some materials which cannot be fusion welded, can be done with a solid state welding process too. So this course deals this with all the three type of joining processes and various other types of joining processes too. There are some metals which will not uh, get joined that easily, like aluminium. We'll have to uh, go for certain technologies and uh, uh, innovations in joining them. You will deal all those things in this course. So now the, this course is, deals with powder metallurgy. It may make intricate fine parts that cannot be made with a die and a. Uh, uh, otherwise, if you want to make this this component uh, uh, of this particular size and shape, you need a machine which requires a lot of energy. Got it. Powder metallurgy components uh, generally uses. lot powders very fine powders uh very clean fine uh, powders are collected compacted in a die in the required format and then you heat to a temperature above uh, uh, about 0.6 to 0.8 of the melting point of the metal they start joining by by diffusion and you get a very solid product so this is what powder metallurgy deals with uh, powder metallurgy is uh starts with the powder consolidation uh, and then uh, tintering and uh, to get this are used uh, to get extremely fine engineering products you know this generally is fine uh, smaller in size um now i just want to let you know one more thing that you know uh, uh, department of metallurgy was renamed as department of metallurgical and materials engineering in 2000 by many of the institutes in india the uh, now uh, there are very few institutes which is called as department of metallurgy you know we are all called as department of metallurgy and materials engineering right this was done for uh, this was done in amal jyoti also now the uh, department of uh, department in uh, amal jyoti is called as department of uh, metallurgical and materials engineering right now why why was this renaming uh, done is because uh, there were uh, uh, because the there were a lot of research is going on in 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 fields like ceramics and polymers too along with metals it was it is actually done before also but it was never named in that way got it for example ceramics engineering ceramics are they must required uh, are required when the when uh, there's a tremendous amount of heat their uh, their thermal stability is excellent got it the mechanical properties are very good if they do not have a crack but what happens you know they are brittle in nature ceramics uh, are never used in place for you know where, where uh, you have where you can actually 
have a fear of failure. But ceramics are used in places where uh, you want a thermal um, thermal stability. Uh, if you just look at this, all those metals were melted in crucibles which are made up of ceramics. Got it. So, uh, uh, so they have to withstand that heat without changing the shape. So ceramic engineering was there before also, but most of them are called as refractories during those times. Uh, but it was there in lining of uh, lining of blast furnaces, lining of induction furnaces, lining of, uh, of basic oxygen furnaces. It was all studied before also, but uh, um, uh, ceramic engineering was uh, studied uh, in uh, uh, in an advanced way in nowadays. Not only with the traditional ceramics, but with advanced ceramics like you know uh, 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 like uh, silicon controlled rectifiers, um, semiconductors. All, all, all those, um, all those silicon metallurgy is what, what we, we call that. You know, so, so, uh, so we, uh, we do a lot of, a uh, lot of work on advanced ceramics, which conducting ceramics. Um, uh, we call it as electronic materials. Uh, they say that you know the advancement in, 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 uh, in uh, computer hardware as, as well as mobile technology is because there's the, the, no sufficient material development in that field. So there is a lot of scope of, of working in that particular field in traditional as well as advanced ceramics. Polymer science and technology, you have seen this in recent years, you know, you have seen this doctors and PPEs and, uh, and uh, people who are working in virologists doing all, all PPEs, uh, they, it, it, it proves that, you know, polymers are not bad. They have been used in many, many places if you just Name them. They use the, uh, the disposable syringes, uh, um, the biomaterials, the screws made up of, uh, of uh, polymers that has been used inside uh, you know, inside the bond, which gets biodegraded after some time. The there are no more blood uh, bottles now. They are all blood bags. So polymers, you know, uh, polymers are ruling the world now. Uh, we can always say that to avoid plastics, but you know, you will never happen. You'll have to live with plastics but responsibly. This is a composite as an advanced material. Got it. Uh, 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 extremely lightweight is what they say. If you look at the Boeing uh, 7-8 sand Dreamliner, 50% of the weight uh, reduction is done by a composite. A Boeing 787 Dreamliner has 50 percentage composites in, uh, in them, uh, which has reduced the uh, which has reduced the weight to a larger extent. When the weight of an aircraft is reduced to a larger extent, the thrust increases, the fuel efficiency increases, can take passengers to a long, longer distance. Uh, you see here a composite. Uh, which, this this happens. Polymers generally do not have strength. Plastics generally do not have strength. The strength can be improved by by reinforcing something which is really hard into them. And uh, in the same case with the metals, although we have meta metallic composites where the metal is the base and uh, ceramics is, is the reinforcement. So metal-based composites, metal matrix composites, are something very very commonly used in aircraft. Okay, there are some. So, so, this is called uh, this figure again shows. Um, uh, a hybrid composite or, or a sandwich composite where you can see that you know you have a form in the the technology says that you know this uh, SMA actuated deployable space antenna called a shape memory alloy uh, this is basically a, a, a this is basically an alloy where you, can, you uh, they say that uh, you can uh, you can, they'll remember its shape they'll remember its shape when when you give them uh, the time so if you want a if you want a satellite, uh, we'll crumble the satellite and, and send in a space vehicle. And when it reaches the orbit, it will it will it will actually remember its old shape and and, and come back. It's called a shape memory alloy. We process the alloys in such a way that uh, uh, such a way that you know we, we we actually crumble them and make them remember their shapes uh, when the real atmosphere comes. They say nanomaterials is, uh, is an emerging technology now. Uh, they say that the surface area, when the material becomes smaller and smaller, the surface area of material increases. When the surface area of material uh, uh, material increases, 
they say the reactivity area is increased or our surface area is increased surface energy is increased and surface energy is increased you can do wonders you can make chips which is as fine as your your, your fingers there are many areas where nanomaterials are involved just like catalyst you have know catalyst catalyst is something that has been added to alter the speed of a reaction now if you are if you have catalyst in the nano form and the surface area is very high the reactions can be extremely fast material technology uh, called as biomaterials materials that can be used inside a inside a body they say that Uh, the primary thing that you need to understand in a biomaterial aspect is they should not they should not react corrosion resistance corrosion engineers have to really work hard to make a biomaterial the rate of corrosion should be extremely low in a biomaterial got it they should not react with your body fluid we call it biocompatibility somehow you have to fool your brain that this device uh, the, the, the device is a part of your body got it if if your brain feels that there is a foreign thing present inside your body they immediately do so so uh, what we generally do is to coat with something called as hydroxyapatite and put inside your body and fool the brain saying that yes it is basically something something uh, something very similar to your bone and then just 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 fix it called something that called as an implant biomaterials need not be implants every time uh this is this is uh, this is a file photo of former president apj abdul kalam interacting with poly affected children got it uh he when he interacted he found that you know the poly affected children are not able to run uh because of the those heavy calipers that they carry which is made up of steel so he said that they are not able to run uh because of because while running they now the first of all they have some deformity along with that they'll have to carry this uh, this steel which is having a 7.2 gram per cc density and then run which is not possible this made him to do some research on this and he came up with a carbon carbon composite uh, caliper which weighs only 900 grams uh, which uh, which, uh, which makes uh, this and for the further research then it is now only 300 grams uh, where you can actually uh, take it and run so this uh, this is something uh, which is done in biomaterials and i wanted to uh, the uh, and i want uh, uh, wanted to uh, let you know about this uh, where you land uh, when you do this course but these are some few of the advertisements that i have come across uh, uh, in 2019 and 20 very recent years but you, uh, you 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 will see this baba atomic research centers have called for scientists uh, uh, the, the third row that you see here uh, they ask for a btech metallurgical and materials engineering degree ISRO uh, VSSC Vikram Sarabhai Space Center has called uh, for metallurgy degrees uh, uh, you know uh, the three posts this, this happened in 2019 December uh, hardly 6 months before right. so so this so is clearly mentioned that you should have a degree in btech in uh, in metallurgical engineering you should have a btech degree in metallurgical engineering if you just look at uh, the companies like national aluminum corporation got it uh, look at the vacancies where you have 13 vacancies for btech metallurgical engineering got it uh, whereas uh, you look at the other branches 30 uh, uh, other branches of engineering you know uh, civil engineering has five branches there is a tremendous need of metallurgists in, in the in these places where uh, uh, where they they always insist on having a btech metallurgical engineering degree hindustan copper has is requiring uh uh btech engineer btech metallurgical engineering uh, yeah. this is uh, drdo uh, uh, the post this time uh, in 2020 drdo has called for 20 uh, metallurgical engineers there are plenty of csr labs like national metallurgical laboratory CSIR National Institute of Interdisciplinary Science and Technology which is there in Trivandrum all this all these labs generally call for metallurgists uh, as the uh, which who have um, an experience of working under in this particular field and uh, before i conclude i would like to say that you know uh, btech in metallurgical and materials engineering in kerala 
I'm so proud that Amal Jyoti is the first institute which, uh, which has uh, started this particular course, and I congratulate all the faculties uh, uh, and the authorities who uh, who mold their uh, mold the students for the benefit of the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Rajesh sir, for your for your very pleasing as well as very informative talk on this uh, topic on metallurgical and materials engineering. Really, it was a very interesting talk. And for a, any graduate or a fresher who is seeking a, uh, like an engineering aspirant who is looking forward for doing something special, they will be really motivated with this uh, the content which we had for the past one hour. And I really believe that everyone will be benefiting from this. Now this session is open for some queries. If uh, some general queries are there, it can be uh, posted in the chat box. It will be available for some minutes. So if the participants have any queries, you can just post it in the chat box. We will have an open discussion for the time. Uh, yes, sir, one question has come. Uh, yeah. What are the common shape memory alloys? Uh, uh, shape memory, uh, uh, shape memory uh, uh, nickel, nickel titanium is uh, 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 nitinol, uh, nickel titanium alloys, you know, are uh, a very common shape memory alloys. There are copper based shape memory alloys too. Pardon. We, we, we uh, actually shape memory. Uh, uh, the compositional shape memory alloys are, are experimentally found out for certain temperature wise. Nickel titanium is, uh, is a very famous uh, shape memory alloy. Uh, sir, another general question has come. Is yeah. there any uh, like eligibility criteria to apply for uh, BRDO? Yeah, see, uh, uh, see what, what has happened is uh, once upon a time, uh, uh, institutes like DRDO used to conduct their own tests. All right. Now, for the past many years, uh, what they do is, you after finishing your uh, uh, metallurgical engineering, in the final year, you can write uh, 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 an entrance examination called as graduate aptitude test for engineering in metallurgical engineering. You clear graduate aptitude test for engineering, you become eligible for all the sectors. You just need to apply, that's it. So, uh, a, a systematic study of engineering for four years, Clearing of gate, you are into a job. There is no worry. Sir, uh, sir another question. Uh, hmm. What is the mechanism behind self-healing materials? <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, uh, uh, see, see what happens, you know. Uh, uh, there are some materials, see, like, there are some materials like, suppose if you have a steel rod inside your body. Uh, if, if you have a steel rod inside your body, uh, uh, they, uh, your body tends to reject this because uh, we don't need uh, we don't need so much of iron in our body because when the iron content increases and when, when the iron ions increase inside your body, your brain senses that the body senses that and reject it. But suppose if you are going for a magnesium alloy in your body, where your body needs magnesium, where your body needs magnesium, your implant is will be serving two purposes. Implant serves as an implant. Implant serves as a deficiency in magnesium also. So it is basically uh, uh, basically heat. Thank you, sir. Now, is there any... Uh, uh, there's somebody... <laughs> what are some... Uh, some uh, big private firms that hire a metallurgist. There are many. There are many. I'm, I'm telling you. See, uh, see, it's not only a government job. I want to tell you that. Uh, tell you, but I forgot to tell you. There are a lot of private industries which employ metallurgists. For example, there are there are people who prefer private industries too. 
they say that getting a job in tata steel is much better than uh, any other there are people who think like that sorry tata steel is, is they say is much more than a government job but tata steel is is one of the best uh, steel industry in india which started before say but so if you are getting a tata there are industry like jindal jindal vijayanagar steel which requires plenty of metallurgists there are uh, there are private industries like ispat steel got it so private players are more private players are more in metallurgical industries rather than government ones government uh, deals with only strategic materials but that's why you have a huge competition in steel steel uh, steel sectors got it if you look at kerala there are industries in kerala there is an industry called as pk steel castings in calicut which recruits metallurgists you know where from where they recruit they recruit from from bihar because they do not get candidates in kerala sir there is a comment from a sigmar sir india has the largest metallurgical industries in government and private sectors correct to add, yeah. to add to that point india has yeah. the largest metallurgical yeah. industries in government and private sectors and in 2000 if you look at the look at the uh, look at the statistic india is the second largest producer of steel after china of course Sir, then another general question: Does metallurgy have a good scope outside India? Obviously. See, once upon a time, people who take metallurgical and materials engineering, uh, it was extremely easy to get a visa outside. The 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 amount of the amount of metallurgical jobs. See, if you just look into Middle East, uh, most of the steel industries like to have their plant in Middle East because you have 365 days with the same climate. Or 365 days with the same climate, and 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 then the, the 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 product comes out so nice. So if you just look at the look at those areas, you see a lot of metallurgical industries there. And not only that, if you look at the uh, look at Middle East, uh, you uh, where you have oil businesses going on. they will have lot of pipeline will have lot of welding lot of non destructive testing lot lot of metallurgical jobs in, in, in fact the amount of jobs that you have outside india is much more uh, than that you have in india sir then another uh, one uh... and actually it's a very informative thing i think what are the what are your views on wire arc additive manufacturing as a future uh, prospect okay i think he has come for my wire arc uh, course uh, at webinar 2 yeah <laughs> yeah see uh, additive manufacturing is coming up as a new uh, uh, emerging field got it i mean uh, generally we we do this uh, uh, we do not do this in an undergraduate uh, uh, we generally do it after that um the advantage of additive manufacturing is uh, there are some components which are extremely difficult to make for example for example a big casting you know if you want to make a big church bell if you want to make a big church bell it's so tough to make uh, there is only one there is only one order for a church bell god that is that is another problem you know when when the amount of order that you get is only limited and the size is extremely huge how will you generate your profit when you when you want to sell it at you will have to sell it at a very high cost that's why church bells generally cost you lakhs of rupees because there is only one one church bell that you get so if you just look at it in an aircraft component like that which is very very big all right the amount of time required to make that is almost 2 to 3 years because if you want to do a casting it will take 12 months machining will take another 7 months got it so two and a half years you have to wait for your product to come out of the industry got it whereas wire arc manufacturing additive manufacturing can do this in few weeks so uh, uh, so that cost saving is not not only a, not only the mechan uh, the material cost saving the cost saving is uh, for for those those which you have to pay for two two years so so wire arc additive manufacturing is will be a good replacement for some manufacturing processes on a large scale correct wire arc manufacturing has to be researched a lot because 
working on these elements are not that easy. For example, if you wanted to force titanium, if you wanted to actually metal form titanium, it's so difficult because you cannot work at higher temperatures. So you need to actually work. You need to actually work on the, those areas in additive manufacturing uh, so that it is not exposed to exposed to oxygen and other things. So uh, uh, I don't think uh, uh, I don't think viral additive manufacturing has got a, a certification till now that uh, that this product can be used by uh, no uh, because if something has to be used in aeronautics, you need to have certification from that. There are only few products which have got. There, others are. They are all on the R and D, R and D level, and we always see a big, uh, big, big future for that. So a lot of people need to work for that. But, and if you have a metallurgy background, it's, it's very, very easy. I mean, I, 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 I literally feel that you know, people should be tech metallurgical engineering should get into this, uh, this type of additive manufacturing to understand the material behavior. And for the information of the participants. Uh... Uh, previously, there is a talk uh, which was taken by Rajay sir for our students and this is available in uh, the Facebook page of our college. So those who are interested can visit that web, uh, web page and uh, can have a uh, thorough understanding of why are additive manufacturing from that class. Rajay sir, can we have one more question? Uh, there is a general yeah, question. No problem, no problem. What, are the, what is the scope of Masters in Materials Engineering in India? Uh, see, uh, I don't know all those IITs. All those IITs, NITs have master's program also. Master, when, when, when master's program is offered for metallurgical engineering, they will ask you in which area you are going to specialize. Got it. The most common two areas that you, they ask for is process metallurgy. Uh, process metallurgy where you will be doing on extractive metallurgy, steel making, iron making, an exclusive course on that. All right, an exclusive course on that. And this master's problem program has had a problem once upon a time. You know, many of the institutes didn't get the students for the master's program because most of the metallurgical graduates got already got a job. That was the reasons why this institute started opening this course for mechanical engineers also. So, uh, and mechanical engineers joining process metallurgy, many people are, are working in steel industries now. So, masters, the another masters pro program is materials engineering, where you study physical metallurgy, mechanical metallurgy, advanced materials, and, and other aspects. You will, you generally land up uh, in, uh, research and development and other, other areas. So all those IITs have all those IITs who are having B.Tech program in India are having master's program also. All those NITs who are having a master's program in India are having uh, uh, B.Tech in uh, metallurgy is having master's program also. There is just a good amount of chance. So I think there are uh, uh, no more questions coming up. Uh, so now I invite. Uh, Mr. Vishnu Casey, Assistant Professor, Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering, to deliver the vote of thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sir. So, uh, good evening to one and all. So, first of all, I would like to thank Rajay sir for this very wonderful and informative talk. So, actually, this talk discussed about the metallurgical and materials engineering in a simple but very highly efficient way. And also it discussed about what you are going to study or what the students are going to study in the metallurgical and materials engineering and what are the future scopes in this particular field. I am pretty sure all the students, all the participants who have participated in this webinar are highly benefited. And also it has helped to create a general awareness, which is probably lacking in Kerala in this particular course. So which is only Amaljyoti is being offering at the moment. So on behalf of the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to Dr. Rajesham for accepting our invitation to take this wonderful session. So our heartfelt thanks to all the participants for the active participation. Okay, sir. Now, before we are going to wind up our session, I would like to show you our next talk of this webinar series. So I hope you can see this one. So the next talk is on the role of metallurgy and material scientists in Indian space research programs. And it is being taken by Professor K. Srikumar, who is a retired group director 
at VSC CP from Sarapai Space Center ISRO. So it will be on 1st of August at 5 to 6 p.m. For all those who are registered, please don't miss this session. This is going to be a wonderful one. So the details of the session will be mailed to you as well as it can be available in our Telegram group. Now for those who are to register newly for this one, you can register and attend this session. Now the contents of this particular talk will be uploaded in our YouTube channel. So I'll be showing you that also, just a moment. So we are having, this is our YouTube channel, this is the department of MME. So the contents of this talk, we will be uploading here. Also you can see our Facebook page, this is our Facebook page. It also will be uploaded on our Facebook page also. So thank you. Uh, Vishnu? Can yes, sir. Me, Vishnu? Yes, sir. Why is this uh, my video is not coming? I'm not going to help you. Yes, sir. Yes. Video on and mute. I'm going to mute them. I'm going to mute them. I'm going to mute them. I'm going to mute And I am very sure that uh, all the participants who are out here will be benefiting from the talk which we had today. So once again, a very sincere thanks from the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering to Dr. Rajesh sir. And uh, though for those who have missed out today's talk, the talk is available uh, and the video of today's talk is available on the Facebook page of the, our college as well as you can browse for the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm.